If you're going to build a sports car, you better do it right. That means taking care of the fundamentals like balance and weight distribution, but that stuff is obvious. Just as importantly, the same principle applies philosophically. And that means sticking to the mission and striking what can be a delicate balance between listening to customer feedback and not relenting to unrealistic pressure. Mazda's been the poster child of what happens when that's done the right way, and the MX-5 proves that incremental change and righting past wrongs can add up in the best ways possible. And then there's the 2022 Toyota GR86, a car that feels very much like its predecessor, but with enough of the right improvements to make this a proper evolution of the sports car experience. car reviews don't forget to share our channel and subscribe so you can catch some of this and maybe even a little of that let's kick this video off with some semantics and what it means to be new versus all new does it even matter personally i don't think so but it is an important distinction to make because usually all new by my definition at least means it's a new vehicle a new name maybe new platform and parts if it's going to kind of carry over but in this case it has some, but not all of that. So I wouldn't classify this as all new, especially because of that platform. Now, don't forget this thing launched way back in 2014 as the Scion FRS and the Subaru BRZ. Toyota and Subaru got together to build a lightweight sports car and it was a success. I thought it was a pretty good car, but yes, it did need at least a few little changes and tweaks. And that's what got us here today nothing major it's not one of those crazy overhauls it's not like something like the mazda mx5 when it went from the nc generation to the nd it looked different felt different everything about it was pretty much different this not so much but again that's not a bad thing there was a lot to like about the old car and all of that stuff carried forward now it starts with the platform that Subaru claims uses design elements of its global platform, which is stiffer than before, but it doesn't say exactly what those design elements are. So can't really get into it too much, but I'd imagine it has to do with stuff like structural adhesives and the use of high strength steel. Those are the hallmarks of the SGP. And both brands claim that this car is stiffer than before. I have no reason to doubt it. There's also no reason to talk about the numbers because it's really not something you're gonna notice. Even if you've driven the old car, you're not gonna sit there and say, oh yeah, this thing is definitely 60% more structurally rigid than before. Oh yeah, that lateral stiffness, you can really feel it through the corners. No, 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 that is not the case, but I'm willing to trust that it is because it felt good before, feels good now. And really, that's what a car like this is all about, balanced nimble lightweight and stiff you don't want all that flex in the chassis itself when you were pushing this car through the corners now what is new this time around is the engine again kind of it's just basically a bored out version of the old one it used to be a two liter four cylinder now it's 2.4 liters it makes 228 horsepower and 184 pound feet of torque the old one made 205 horsepower and 156 pound-feet of torque. So those are fairly significant jumps. Now, not necessarily by the numbers, by what you can feel though, it's definite, especially all that extra torque. There's still that torque dip right in the high 3000s. It lasts through about five grand, but that last 2000 RPM up to the 7,000 RPM red line, it is just sweet. Now, when this car was announced, Subaru described it as running counter to the trend of putting power over precision. And I love that. I think it really sums it up. It's not just marketing and PR jargon. It makes a lot of sense because, you know, cars today, they are very powerful and almost unnecessarily so. This car should never be turbocharged, at least not from the factory. What you do on your own time 
that's up to you. But as a brand building a sports car like this, it was important for that natural aspiration. And then you could also take advantage of the boxer design, horizontally opposed. So it sits super low in the engine bay and there's just that inherent balance to it. And again, just having that high revving natural aspiration. Yeah, you do have to get over that little bit of a torque dip that again is way better than before. But once you do, there's the dip. I mean, it's quick. I think it'll do zero to 100 in 6.1 seconds, which is about a second quicker than the old car. The automatic, it's actually slower than this, which is kind of rare these days. That'll do it in about, I think, six and a half to the high sixes to 100, which is about a second and a half quicker than it used to be. But again, that's not what this car is about. It's not about straight line speed. It's about winding roads and track days. And in that way, it is very successful at applying kind of the same philosophy as the Mazda MX-5. Now, some of you guys know, I personally own an NA2, an NA8 Mazda Miata. It's a 1995. And yeah, technically it's the same formula. Jody and I were talking about this the other day, how similar and different they feel. Well, it's hard to say, especially because the MX-5 current and before it's a roadster. This is a coupe, so it doesn't feel quite the same. And my car is also almost 30 years older than this one. But for the most part, you can feel that successful execution of the balance. Both of them are almost perfect 50-50 weight distribution. And you can really feel that when you are hustling them around. This just feels very modern and very sharp. There's also some other improvements. Now, transmission ratios, the same, but the clutch, way better than it used to be. That was like so soft, no real feel to it, but this one is much better. I still kind of struggle to heel and toe in this thing, but in terms of clutch pedal feel, it is very, very nice. Now it's interesting with my heel and toe struggles because if you take a look again at my Miata, the pedal box is super tiny, but I can do it no problem. That's probably the easiest car I have ever encountered when it comes to heel and toe. This one, there's more room. I don't know if it's the way that this console comes up here or what, it's just really awkward for me. And that makes the absence of auto rev matching at least a little bit of a disappointment for me, but I can deal with it because again, once I get the hang of it, it's not too, too bad. And really this car, it's all about the fun, no matter what, even if you can't heel and toe, you can still have a blast behind the wheel. Not many cars you can have this much fun for this price point either. This one starts at around 33 and a half grand. And then this premium one I'm driving, it's three grand more. If you want the automatic, it's another 2,500 bucks or so on both trims. I personally would skip it, but I understand some of you out there might not like driving manual or you can't, but I really would give it a go. This one is easy to drive. Now, boxer engines, they're not always that friendly for those starting out, but this one is not too bad. I wouldn't say it's the easiest car if you're just learning how to drive stick, but it shouldn't take you too long to get the hang of it. Now, something else to go over here is the interior, and I still don't think it is among the nicest around. I gotta say, Ooh. the sports seats, great in this premium trim with the leather and Alcantara. Alcantara here on the window sills, as well as above the gauges. That's really cool. But otherwise, some of the plastics in here, not all that nice to look at or touch. I know that's not really what a car like this is all about, but you are going to want to spend a lot of time in the driver's seat. And for a guy like me, surprising just how much room there is. This car is technically a little bit lower than it was before, but I somehow fit better than I did in the last car. I have enough headroom now, barely, but I am comfortable. I'm not slouched. That is the key. I'm about six foot three. So it's nice to have all that room inside for you and a passenger, but don't expect to get much out of the back seats as far as space for people or stuff. The other thing I'm sure you guys have noticed so far in this video, the camera, or at least me moving around a lot on these rough <laughs> country roads, the suspension is very stiff. That's not surprising in a car like this, but what is, is that 
beneath that layer of stiffness, there is some springiness, but you don't really access it until you're above certain speeds. I'm talking faster ones. So that means if you're out on the highway, a heave, well, it might have a surprisingly soft landing, but more importantly, when you're out on the track or on a back road like this one, it really helps with weight transfer. So you can pivot more easily on those front wheels when you brake, as well as you can load up the back ones when you accelerate. You can actually feel it pitching around, and that is great because that's what a car like this is all about. It makes up for the lack of outright output by being incredibly quick in the corners. Now, a good friend of mine and a contributor to autotrader.ca, Sammy Hedgesad, great guy, has owned a Scion FRS since 2015. He bought it brand new. He's put about 100,000 kilometers on it over the years. And we were talking earlier this week about this car because he's also driven the GR86. And I'd say he's pretty authoritative on how this car can and should feel. And he said the same thing as me. It's the same, just a little bit better and better in the right ways. And I say it's kind of akin to a GoPro. If you take a look at a Hero 8 and a Hero 10, yeah, they're mostly the same. It's just the subtle differences that stand out and make that Hero 10 better. That's very much what's going on here. I do think it's a better car, but in the right ways. And what else makes it better? Well, some of the features. Now, again, this is new-ish for 2022, and that means updated amenities. This touchscreen, better than before. Apple CarPlay and Android Auto, both here. Not much else. There's no built-in navigation, but I'm a big fan of using Google Maps anyways. Stereo's okay. It is a little noisy in here, so if you're on a road trip, you are going to want to crank the tunes. But then when you're on the track, it's nice to have that volume down and you can really hear exactly what's happening both outside and inside the car. So that's great. It's the kind of car you just kind of wear it. And I know that's a bit of a cliche, but you get inside, it just fits the seats, nice amount of bolstering. The views are great. Having that long hood out in front, this really just feels like an excellently executed sports car that still stays very true to its mission, but it's improved in the right ways. The last thing I wanna say about this interior, not a ton of small item storage. And again, I know that's not what a car like this is about, but it would be nice to have a place to keep your wallet, your sunglasses, that sort of stuff. You can toss it on the passenger seat if you're driving by yourself, but if you have someone with you, yeah, you're gonna have to toss it in the glove box because there's really nowhere else to put it. You do have these cup holders back here on the console, but they are very awkward, especially in this manual car. And that means you can use this one in the door pocket. It is very flat, which is great. It's not just a bottle holder. But earlier this morning, I was reminded that you do have to be careful. I had my coffee cup in here when I was getting ready to head out, closed the door after putting my mic on, spilled coffee everywhere. Not exactly ideal. It is very handy to have, but it's not perfect. Again, that's not necessarily what this car is about, but it is something worth pointing out. And then there's the matter of what you can fit in the back. Something tells me there aren't many of you out there shopping for a car like this with much care about cargo carrying, but you might be surprised to see just how much space there is in here, in spite of what the spec sheet says, because officially it's got something like 170 liters. But just take a look, I've got a camping chair, a cargo box, and a toolbox with room to spare. And part of the legend of this car has been that you can fold the back seats, throw a set of track tires in the back, and that way you have your track rubber and your road rubber. I dig the way it's all laid out. I also dig this duckbill spoiler on the back of this premium trim. It is a great look. Something else you get with the premium trim, sticky Michelin Pilot Sport 4 tires make great use of that limited slip rear differential. And then as far as the styling goes, looks a lot like the old one, just better. It's got a little bit of improvement here and there, and it's got this great front end. I love that big, low, and wide grill. It makes it look like it's going to gobble up all that asphalt, whether you're on the road or the track. 
Now, don't forget there's a Subaru BRZ that looks virtually identical to this, except for one glaring exception, the front end. It makes it look like a demented Disney character. It ruins the whole thing for me. Some of you will be interested to know that the BRZ in Canada, it's $2,000 cheaper across the board, and that does bug me at least a little bit because they're virtually identical, but I'd personally be willing to pay that tax just so I didn't have to live with that front end. To recap, I like the incremental improvements to the power and performance of the GR86, the way it looks and the way it fits around the driver. I don't like some of the cheap feeling plastics inside or that it's more expensive than the BRZ, but come on, there's really not much wrong with this thing. You know, this thing really didn't need much heading into its second generation. It was just a case of taking a good car and making it better. It's balanced and fun just like it was before, but the extra output and new clutch feel were exactly what it needed to really elevate the entire drive experience. Finding affordable fun isn't easy these days, but if you're looking for it, the Toyota GR86 is a pretty good place to start.